Okie dokie, artichokies. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Debona. I'm your open source programs manager. Um, this is a, another uh, speaker in our long series of distinguished, amazing people in open source software. Um, Eben Moglen, I met first, um, I think it was around the DVD CCA case, uh, when a fellow named uh, John Lex Johansson published a little piece of code, and then another fellow took that piece of code and printed it on his website. And it was promptly, uh, I guess, not arrested. Was he actually arrested for that? Uh, or was he John, Johansson was. Uh, the morning after you and I spent that day in court in San Jose, they came and busted him in Norway. Yeah, that's right. So uh, so we worked on that. And uh, I had the good fortune of, uh, of seeing sort of what happens in the courtroom and realized that's not a place for me. As such, we financially support Evan whenever we can. And, uh, and, and his work with the Free Software Foundation, as well as the Software and Freedom Law Center, which I'm sure he'll, he'll mention in passing in this discussion. Got to advertise um, for I don't know how much of a bio you want to give for yourself. Uh, I just, I'd rather just let you talk because you're, you're better at it than I am. So, everyone, Evan Muglum. Well, thank you. I'm going to pretend then that I don't need a biography and that we can talk about the future instead of the past, which is what I'd like to do. Uh, it is uh, a privilege and an honor for me. I've been uh, waiting to come here. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, this is also being uh, recorded for the public, so keep your questions public friendly. Thanks. There you go. I can't promise to keep the talk public friendly, but we'll see how the combination works. Uh, the, uh, uh, I've been waiting to come here for a long time, and it's uh, a, a great honor for me to make a first visit here. I have. Um, been working with free software programmers long enough uh, to have spent many years uh, of my life responding to a question that goes, well, free software seems to be sort of good at imitating important stuff done by other people like Microsoft, but it never really does anything new, does it? And of course, one of the easiest ways of answering that question after a certain moment was to say, well, where did you ever see anything like Google before? That is to say, in coming here, I am making uh, a long delayed pilgrimage to one of the monuments of the new, a monument constructed out of your ingenuity and materials, uh, which uh, I've seen shaped at the quarry uh, over the years, the materials of free software which make the scale on which we deliver information and knowledge to one another all the way around the world possible. So for me, uh, it's um, a, a little breathtaking and a little bit throat catching in the way that any monument is, and uh, particularly gratifying when I think about the world from which I started doing the work, as you all started doing the work, when all of this would have been a dream that would have been hard even to explain to people uh, who now use it every day, depend upon it, assume it's there, and would, in fact, no longer really know how to lead their day-to-day -day lives without it. Which means, I suppose, that I want to offer myself as um, the friendly outside observer, uh, a role in which I hope I may be able to talk a little bit about the long-term curve of the ecological relationship between Google and the free software environment. In doing that, I want to talk in particular about the ways in which we can study in the past some of the ecological crises uh, for enterprises we may not be quite so fond of, uh, but whose experience in dealing with the free world sets some useful guides uh, to what may be the problems and the challenges in future that we can avoid now. If you think about the poor devils in Redmond, and the difficulty that now besets them. I think you can see it as a form of fulfillment of the idea that you have to catch problems while they're young. As a person whose job it was while the problems of Microsoft were young, uh, was to keep Microsoft from knowing how to nip them in the bud, from seeing the free world for what it was when they could have stomped it out easily. I suppose I have to say that a lot of my work as a lawyer, particularly in the earlier days of the free software movement, was directed at camouflage, or at least at conflict avoidance. 
If you think about the state of affairs when I first started working for Stallman in 94 and 95 and 96, if we had thrown our weight around too aggressively in the enforcement of freedom in the courts, we would have died young. We would have had our resources exhausted. We would have been bled to death by a party infinitely larger and more uh, resourced than we. And we would have lacked for visible and um, recruitable allies. Because at that stage, parties had not yet realized how important to the enterprise of the future free software was going to be. And the vendors had not understood what it was that they had at stake in the survival of this model of making software. It was, in short, our job to keep Microsoft from understanding how deeply the copy left threatened their way of thinking about software. That it was bringing about a fundamental change from software as a product to software as a public utility enabling services. A change that would require a rethinking of the very business model upon which they had based themselves. A very conception of what it was they did and what they turned out the door at the end of the day. Because in 95, Mr. Gates had still not quite sustained the enlightenment concerning the existence of the internet, it was not entirely surprising that he was late to the enlightenment concerning the copyleft and its effect on the idea of software as product. By the time they had figured out that the copyleft involved a reconsideration of the balance between software and service, it was already beginning to be too late to change. And now, at a time in which the oppositional characteristic of what we do is fully defined and perfectly understood, it may be that Microsoft no longer has time in which to change. This is an example of how a failure to grasp what the other fellow is thinking produces serious distortions in the ability to realize uh, the full effect of one's own investments. Had it been possible for Microsoft to think more clearly about what the free world was up to when the free world was small, I hesitate to imagine what solutions might have been applied to the problem. But I think it is quite obvious that the solutions applied in 1996 would have been far more effective for Microsoft than the solutions being applied in 2007. This is, of course, a, a battle of light against dark, good against evil, and has nothing to do, therefore, with the relations between the free world and Google. We are all creatures of light. Uh, and I wouldn't leave you to imagine that I'm suggesting that there is some respect in which we might ever discover that we are separated by a line of moral judgment. But it is not only a line as definite as the line between good and evil. Uh, that we're talking about. Even people who promise never to do evil and mean it and make good on it are still likely to have their little diplomatic tiffs from time to time. And it is even possible that such tiffs, if not addressed when they are young, could turn into challenges and difficulties that are harder to resolve later on. I want then to talk a little bit about where I think we might find ourselves uh, in need of a few drops of oil now. Uh, before we begin to find some metal shavings in the bottom of the engine at the end of the day, uh, before we begin to run things a little past tolerances and pressure starts to go up. Because I think we ought, as conservators, which is what I know I am in my business, and I suspect you know you are in yours, as conservators, it is our responsibility to address problems before they happen rather than after. The whole of my work essentially concentrates on helping free software makers and distributors to prevent rather than to fix problems. And if I therefore sound like a party calling out about some things that haven't happened yet and aren't likely to, I hope you'll grant me the uh, tendency to understand that it's just the habit of my job to look for the things over the horizon before they become problems in order to prevent them from growing into the kinds of problems it is expensive to fix. With that in mind, let me offer a short, compressed view uh, of what I think Google looks like now from the non-Google part of the free world. Uh, in the first place, uh, as I'm sure you recognize too when you think about the new uh, investments in hardware, uh, Google looks like the first industrial strength part 
of the 21st century economy. Moving to cheap hydroelectric power the way 20th century industrial corporations like aluminum smelters moved to cheap hydroelectric power. In other words, a landscape altering presence in the free world. Landscape altering at a level of ecological significance which makes you at once the largest and most complex organism in the entire ecosystem. Dependent, as all organisms are, on surrounding parts of the natural environment. And it is the ecological balance between the new largest and most sophisticated and most capable organism in the environment and the rest of the environment, which is the theme of my analysis. We may take for granted, I think, between ourselves, that the work of data mining, the work of understanding the connections between data particles uh, traveling in a soup of optional delivery, people who decided to hand you stuff to think about, is honorable and important work, capable of improving human life in every direction as well as making heaps of money. But precisely because it is power, because it makes money in vast quantities, because it consumes power in vast quantities, and because it depends upon skilled brains and free software, it is an ecological intersection where the trust of all parties must be carefully maintained. The data upon which Google operates, it gains on an opt in interface. People voluntarily bring information, their email, their habits, their search information, their desires, their geographic locations, and all the rest. And they ask for that data to be conserved for them, reprocessed for them, redelivered to them in a variety of powerful and useful ways, allowing the parties who undertake that effort also to make inferences from that data for their own profit. This is a perfectly respectable activity. There isn't a thing in the world wrong with it, and it is changing the face of human life. But it's important to recognize that it is possible because the interface is an opt-in interface, because people have voluntarily brought their data there under terms which they either do or at least can understand. It would not be right, however, to think of the software, the executable software taken in, as coming also across solely an opt-in interface. It comes, in fact, on an opt-out interface. If you think about it on the other side from you, you are the opt-in parties. You accept code under licenses, rather than taking in data under terms of service of your own. The consequence is, at least in theory, that the licenses under which the code you take in comes to you could establish limits or bottlenecks or sources of limitation of your use of it. Generally speaking, of course, at the present time, that isn't true. Vast amounts of code are taken in under licenses so permissive as to uh, it limit in no way what is done with them. And even the most complex of the licenses under which code comes in at the present time, the copyleft licenses, GPL, and its near neighbors, place no substantial restrictions on any of the activities within the ecological frame uh, that Google wishes to perform using that code. This is as it should be. And I want to emphasize that from my point of view, it is desirable that it is so. It is not, however, in the nature of the universe that it is so. It is in the nature of the social compact, which is free software, that this is so. And in the very same way that there are conceivable structures of response to Microsoft embodied in the copyleft, no, you should not treat software as a product which is secret until purchased. No, you should not treat knowledge about the operation of computers as a product only the rich can have and only in the quantity that they can afford to consume. No, instead, software is a commons uh, responsive only to the need for the free movement of information. You can imagine, at least in theory, 
changes in the inbound interface for software, which would place significant challenges on the model of we use free software plus open source freely provided data to conduct data mining for both public benefit and private profit. In particular, if we want to look for a tiny example of the theoretical possibilities of difficulty on the free software interface, we can look to the thing which has been called in the past the Afero GPL, a non-GPL license, a variant of GPL, created with the consent of, but not the endorsement of, the Free Software Foundation in connection with the Afero organization, a profit-making company founded by Henry Poole. Poole, as you may recall if you've ever studied this rather obscure corner of the free software licensing world, was interested in creating a web application uh, for the assistance of money raising by nonprofit organizations based around email signatures which allowed parties working at nonprofits to provide traceback information to assist donors to support their enterprise. Here, click here on my email sig and donate to my enterprise with the intermediary keeping a tiny transaction fee uh, intended to provide for making the service self-financing. Poole's goal was to ensure that any party seeking to go into the afferroizing way of life would be forced to return their modifications to his web app to Commons, even though they would not be distributing copies of the code, but only performing services with it. So the result was a modification of GPL which said, in effect, and it's not important now what the precise words were or what they did, if you perform services with this code over a network, and if I set things up so you are compelled to disclose your server-side source code to any interactee who cares to ask for it, you may not remove that feature from this code downstream. The effect of that license was to attempt to create a commons within the commons, equally self-protecting in the way that the GPL copyleft commons is, but upon a new kind of opt-in interface for potential users and deliverers of the app, an opt-in interface which required the users of the app to admit their responsibility to return modifications to commons. As those who have watched the GPL3 process at all for any reason, however uh, obscure or doubtful, may have remembered back in the beginning last January when we were preparing to announce the first draft, there was a great deal of press speculation that we meant to embed an Afero-like term in the body of GPL3 itself thus rendering all parties who made use of the code for applications delivery purposes to remote users somehow responsible for the return of mods to commons. Uh, I won't be telling tales out of school if I suggest that Mr. De Bono was an articulate and thoughtful critic of any such scheme all the way along, uh, and it won't be all that mysterious to you why. Of course, it wasn't our intention to make that change, and we did not. We have, however, tried to consider over the course of the last year ways that we might be compatible with such decisions by future licensors, a process of consideration to, in which Mr. De Bona has been an articulate and thoughtful constant participant, uh, presumably on the theory that even consideration of such an idea was a little scary, uh, and he needed to keep his friends very close and his potential enemies even closer. I think that was extremely wise. That is, in fact, of course, the proper Google response uh, to such intentions. Speaking uh, as uh, best I can on behalf of the process, if not the Free Software Foundation, I don't think that that concern is presently necessarily warranted. That is to say, I see no sign in the near term of any desire to drive the copyleft commons in the direction of restrictions upon use by service providers. But I want to stress that I am speaking of the present, and I want to ask us to consider the question whether the present is necessarily the future and what we ought to do about the space between. When the Google Calculator was first rolled out some little while back, and everybody found that it was very neat and went to it immediately to begin work on seeing what it felt like to test drive it, a couple of thoughtful people typed into the box some units calculations, which were known bugs in GNU units. And 
magically, to nobody's great surprise, it turned out that they were also bugs in the Google calculator. This was nothing more than a trivia fact at the time. It was, of course, entirely appropriate to embed GNU units in the, in the Google calculator. Nobody had the slightest concern about it. Everybody just thought it was a fun fact to know and share. And then it wasn't true anymore. And by God, the bugs weren't there anymore. But there wasn't any patch either. And people thought to themselves, well, is there really an enormous business enterprise reason for not returning that patch to GNU units and getting rid of the bugs we all know are there, but nobody's had a chance to squash or an inclination to press on yet? Or maybe, of course, they said, you know, they might have rewritten the whole thing and taken GNU units out, and there's nothing in there that has anything to do with any code that anybody else is using, but we are a little doubtful. And I thought to myself, oh, that's, you know, just Debbie and legal beefing. And I don't have a lot of time for it in my ordinary life. I, I try to solve problems that I think are either present or likely, and this didn't seem to me to be a problem. This didn't even seem to me to be a fun fact to know and tell. But I do think I ought to call your attention to it for what it means as a straw blowing in the wind. I think it's an indication of the direction of a concern. If I were to draw a curve of the clients and non-clients with whom I interact on a daily basis, uh, drawing the propensity to consider Afero GPL an important positive enhancement to the copyleft system against age, I think you would find that concern for the Afero GPL as an improvement to GPL is inversely proportional to age on almost a straight line basis. And it is younger hackers uh, who I think of as the post-Stallman generation of copyleft enthusiasts, among whom the idea of the Afero GPL as a positive enhancement to future copyleft licenses runs strong. I think it is desirable not to strengthen that position any further. And I think it is rather simple to make it go away altogether. I think this brings us back to the question of the difference between the opt-in interface on which open source data is delivered to Google and the opt-out interface upon which free software is delivered. It seems to me from outside, and I don't purport to anything but an outsider's view of the situation, it seems to me from an outsider's perspective that it is entirely reasonable uh, for Google to take the view that all inferences based upon data voluntarily provided by outsiders may be regarded as private property, not for public disclosure of any kind, until such time as there is a compelling business reason to make a disclosure. That is to say, across that interface, on the outbound side, only disclosure that's relevant is voluntary disclosure for Google business purposes. On the opposite polarity interface, however, where software comes in, and particularly software under copyleft licenses, it seems to me that the polarity of the disclosure rule should also be similarly modified. That is to say, where, ver where generally useful changes are made to copylefted software, the balance of equities should shift in the direction of public disclosure and recontribution of those mods where there is no business purpose, no matter how little or large, to compel holding on. Let us imagine then for a moment the difference between an environment in which, let's take it straight to the midline, 50% of the visible modifications of free software made by Google are returned to Commons, and 50% are retained as business value to us, which we seek to expand our right of private modification to embrace. Even at the 50-50 line, I think it almost inevitable that the enthusiasm for the application of the Afero GPL to the conduct of enterprises such as Google would go to zero and remain there permanently. The reason is quite simple. The right of private modification is a valuable right to all hackers. They recognize it, they believe in it, they invoke it, they make use of it. 
to bring hackers to the point of believing that the right of private modification should be interfered with by copyleft licenses requires making them believe there is a danger more important than the preservation of their own convenience and privacy. And that's a heavy lift under ordinary circumstances. Anything other than the appearance of a creation of danger is unlikely to result in moving the hacker community in general towards rules requiring contribution over and above the right of private modification. In other words, in order to bring about a situation in which frictional heating began to occur in the copyleft licensing system disadvantageous to Google's business model, it would be necessary for hackers in the outside world to believe that Google posed a danger sufficiently large to justify overriding the sacredness of the right of private modification. That's not easy to do. But on the other hand, we have some rich friends, or should I call them frenemies in the world, whose fundamental activity with respect to what we both do consists of the creation of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And therefore, we must ask ourselves whether we share a vulnerability to an increase of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, possibly directed at creating a frictional distance between us, which need not be there. And maybe we need to consider diplomatic measures between ourselves as natural allies to, present, to prevent that friction from occurring, to apply a couple of drops of oil to that interface before it begins to heat and metal shavings begin to show up at the bottom of the engine and noises are created which alert some people to our north that there is an opportunity for disruption. I think that it is reasonable to expect that with measures gradual and barely noticeable, not public in any significant way and requiring no marketing or advertising, that we could move the level of friction on this interface to zero and keep it there indefinitely. I don't think that this is a difficult job. I don't think it's scary. I don't think it raises significant problems for anybody. It may be that I don't understand some portion of the problems it would raise in here, but I have long experience in discovering that there are ways of resolving even problems which people very knowledgeable and thoughtful about free and open source software have in their businesses. That is, after all, the place where I tend to work. So I believe that there are reasons for taking another look at the question of publication policy at the software interface line for the purpose of avoiding future difficulties of which others might take skillful advantage to both of our regrets. I also think that this has significant effects on another second order aspect of the ecological relationship between Google and the free world. Because of course the free world contributes two things to Google of extraordinary value. One is executable software and the other is you. Skilled labor, thoughtful skilled labor, well-trained, carefully disciplined skilled labor, not disciplined at behaving like drones in proprietary software, skilled at the processes of agile creation and rapid adaptation and evolutionary uphill movement, which is what the free software ethos is about, is also crucial to the ecological existence of this grand organism. And nobody outside in the free world can be unaware of the depth of Google's need for skilled labor or the intensity of its recruiting. There is an ecological balance issue in this respect too, which arises from the balance of publication or non-publication of modifications to free software. As projects which are themselves constantly in need of skilled labor, find that project members and participants whom they value and care about and need are recruited into an organization where they tend to go radio silent. Resistance to recruiting in those organizations rises too. This is also a form of friction at an interface of importance which is ecologically capable of dissipation. With a little bit of additional social engineering, we could reduce the apparent friction on that interface too. 
Here it may be that my gauges for measurement are uh, in some ways better adapted to the situation than yours are. As recruiters, your tendency is to see either a success in hiring somebody you want or a failure to get somebody yet that you will sooner or later hope to be able to attract. It is among my client base and the circles in which I travel where the ecological question, are we being unfairly treated somehow in the recruiting activity of our giant cousin comes to the fore. And it is to people like me who function as counselors and advisors to those smaller nonprofit makers and distributors that questions come, what can we do to protect the integrity of our project team against predatory recruiting? A conception which it is very much in your interest never to cause hackers to frame in their minds. The phrase predatory recruiting should not exist in the free world. It's not good for you if it does, and it's our shared goal to prevent it from ever shaping itself in hacker minds. It's important at any rate, therefore, for me as the friendly outsider to tell you that we have a little work to do. I would strongly suggest, in other words, that there are ways that interact two or maybe even three of the ecological aspects of your role as the grandest of all organisms, which tie back to the traditions, cultural understandings, and legal institutions of the free world. It is not unacceptable in any way for that to be true. You are the monument to the new, the ways in which the free world begins to build for itself and with its own skills, brains, software, heart, and soul, monuments of human industry that could never have been achieved in the old ways. And it is true, of course, that even for hackers, change is sometimes unwelcome. I know that as well as anybody else in the world right now because the minute I began making GPL3 with Mr. Stallman, GPL2 became perfect. <laughs> as you notice, people who had their doubts, their uncertainties, their fears, even sometimes made querulous statements to the press and other websites about GPL2 suddenly discovered that they loved it like a brother that there was nothing wrong with it. I have come to the conclusion that the only way to complete GPL3 with total unanimity of love and endorsement is to announce the beginning of GPL4. <laughs> Change is always hard. There's no question about it. And there is therefore also no question about the fact that some portion of the friction I am talking about is simply the result of the free world's own difficulty in accepting change. Once upon a time, there was the free world and no Google. Now there is the free world and Google. And even that, in and of itself, can be sufficient to create resistance. And to that resistance, there is nothing to be done but wait. Be patient, be friendly, be cooperative, be who we all are, and it will ease, as it will ease even about such obviously frictional subjects as GPL version 3. But it is not only simple resistance to change. There are genuine questions of ecological balance, genuine questions of resource commitment and allocation, genuine questions about the underlying principles of share and share alike, and they are real and they should be faced really. I shrink from saying openly, lest some background noise begin to start somewhere in the conversation, so let us say we should face them freely and understand by which uh, we mean candidly uh, and with some sense of mutual trust and mutual engagement. This can be difficult when you are powerful because there are many people who interact with you who have no power at all and they wonder about the disparity. Let me offer from the news of the last couple of weeks another last example. If you are a lawyer who specializes in thinking about government subpoenas to data miners for information government could not get any other way, there was much to be pleased with in recent announcements concerning privacy protection here. 
Uh, it is useful if somebody sends you a subpoena and says, could we please have all searches conducted from a certain IP address to be able to say, I'm sorry, we don't have searches from that IP address. Uh, we have searches from a cluster of uh, up to 256 computers, one of which might be that one, but we can't make a meaningful return on the subpoena. And in that sense, uh, to a very small number of lawyers, of whom I guess I'm one by you know, right of having trained the others or something, um, it was a welcome announcement, which was greeted among almost all the people with whom I spoke that week, from 12-year-olds to the CEOs of major software companies, as a total joke and a complete disaster. Uh, the reason was uh, simple, and it's obvious to you as it's obvious to me and was obvious to them. There is, of course, no difficulty about inferring the bottom eight bits of the IP address. In fact, if you deal routinely with customers uh, whose uh, IP address is dynamically assigned by their ISP each time they make a connection, you have to infer the bottom eight bits of their IP address in order to maintain any stability of calculation about who they are. And once you begin differentiating people inside a household who use the same computer, even the bottom eight bits of the address are no longer really important. You're inferring an additional few phantom bits at the bottom of the IP address, which generate information about the specific user of a multi-user machine. So the tendency among the non-lawyers in the technically sophisticated community with whom I spoke was to say Google has just given us a gold brick. All they've done is tell us we're not going to keep any more of the data that isn't reliable and that we don't need anyway. And we're going to go on doing exactly what we used to do, which is spying just as much as we used to spy. Well, I said, you know, up to a point I can certainly understand what you're saying, but you might want to consider the legal implications of what they've done and understand those as independently valuable to privacy. But the lay readers, talkers, thinkers with whom I spoke in the week of your announcement pretty much waved all that away. And I understood why they did it, and so do you. Here was an instance where a little bit more candor and a little bit more depth of discussion would probably have been extremely helpful. Not because there was a bad story that really existed and needed to be diffused, but because it was hard to get a good story out over the technical insights of people who may not have been able to go much further than what they thought was a shrewd technical notion that you were giving away ice in the wintertime. This is a consequence of the very nature of the ecological relationship between the large and the small and the concentrated and the decentralized. It's a consequence of the existence of life as the grandest organism. One could think of it in terms, I suppose, of a kind of social duty, noblesse oblige. But I think, in fact, it's more than that. I think it's a law of ecological life. I think it's a law of what it means to exist in a world of organisms of different sizes and powers where you are yourself the largest, the grandest, and the most capable. It seems to me, then, that what I'm asking, because indeed, of course, I'm always asking. I'm a lawyer. I can't go anywhere without asking for something. Uh, Chris uh, assumed I was going to ask for money for the law firm, but the truth is the money for the law firm is the least of it. I think what I'm asking for uh, is uh, a partner in the discussion of the ecology. I think what I'm asking for is a way to raise questions of the long-term ecology of relation between the free world and Google as an entity unique and special and precious beyond words. I think what I'm looking for is a way to commence dialogue not about what we have to do today and not about what we have to do tomorrow, but how we begin to think long about what it means that this is the achievement you have built and what it means about the relationship between you as builders of this from inside and all of those other parts of the free world who both admire and sometimes fear what you have made. And I think I'm asking for that in part out of my own particular concern for the welfare of the people who may not understand or be willing to trust. But I think I am also asking for what I ask for in the knowledge that there are those who will profit from our divisions deeply, shrewdly, now that they realize them, and dangerously. We are not yet at the point where we can think of this as an ecology troubled only by the problems of peace. This is also an ecology troubled by the problems of war. I hope to live long enough in the work I do to see the end of that phase. 
I believe that it is possible to achieve it. We will, I think, be able in the end to restructure the global IT industry so that there is no party that denies the value of commons or the existence of a reason for coexistence. It will take work, it will take effort, it will take money, it will take luck. It's like any other war, you have to fight it until you win if it's important enough to begin in the first place. But even if we had succeeded now beyond our wildest dreams in creating an age of peace in the global IT industry, even if we had succeeded in embedding the idea of commons so deeply that there was no committed enemy to it, we would still face this problem of the diplomatic relations between the large fish and the small ones. Because I don't want my clients to become Google, don't make the mistake of thinking that that's because I don't like Google. It's because my clients will always be the small fish. Somebody's got to look after them. You can afford excellent lawyers, lots of them. I know just how many there are because I work with just how many there are. My clients can't have any others. There aren't any others for them. There won't be, in the near term, any others. By which I don't mean that we can't train 200 lawyers for the small fish. We can, I hope, and we will, and that's the advertisement for the firm. Send money, make more lawyers for the small fish. But remember that at the end of the day, they're still going to be small compared to you. Remember that at the end of the day, what you want is for their lawyers to be diplomats in relation to you, not adversaries in relation to you not contentious parties in relation to you. What you want is for those interfaces to exist with the lowest possible friction and the largest possible value exchanged. I think we are a few small tweaks from optimum at the moment. And I hope that the remarks that I am making here, taken in the right spirit on all sides, will be a way to begin the process of administering those few mods that we most, gracious, that we most gravely need. I appreciate your thoughtfulness, your pondering, your energy, the engagement with which you face all the problems that confront you in your extraordinary communal life together. And I hope that there will be room for a little consideration of this issue in and among all the others. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, asks for a comparison of IBM's relationship to the free software community with Google's relationship. Um, IBM's relationship to the free software community possesses uh, one advantage uh, uh, in the sense that uh, it does not require very much to persuade IBM to release mods to commons uh, where those mods don't have an overwhelmingly uh, important relationship to their business. Um, the, the idea of a strong hardware and strong software ecology outside IBM has become for IBM, I think, a pretty strong spine in business strategy planning over the long period as far ahead as IBM is inclined to look. And there's a reason for this. IBM now operates, in my judgment, with a very segmented market in mind in which by the middle of the 21st century, IBM's bread is buttered almost entirely by the thousand largest businesses on, and all the governments on Earth. And all customers of a smaller size than that are essentially not the guaranteed IBM market and not where the money comes from. Accordingly, it becomes possible for IBM to be exceedingly aggressive about commoditizing everything except that which can be sold at the highest possible profit to those particular customers. This does not yet result in a single undivided strategy on IBM's part, because IBM remains an extremely large and diverse entity whose internal decision-making processes must allow product managers a significant degree of autonomy. And it is still not the IBM policy to call in the product manager of DB2 and say, we've thought it over up here at the top of the tree. We've taken a vote, and you're an open source project now. Right? But notwithstanding that fundamental internal dishomogeneity, which will persist for decades now, I should think, at least, 
It is still possible for IBM to think fairly along the long-term curve about the difference between what the world's largest customers need and everybody else, and to be ruthless about cleaning out the understory by commoditizing the everything else. If you consider only the flow of GCC patches, for example, I think you'll see the difference in numbers as a difference in qualitative structure. Beyond that, I would make another claim, I think, which is um, that the IBM point of view is, in a way, based more strongly around a we don't distribute anything point of view, even than the Google position is. From the Google position, the we don't distribute anything in the sense of handing out software except software we have decided to hand out is like the IBM position. That is to say, across the software distribution interface, we both keep volume very low and decide how to coordinate our risks appropriately. But the IBM non-distribution policy is based not around a set of concerns with license terms, but around a set of concerns with business risks who will sue for patent infringement, and who won't. And those risks you must take. You cannot avoid them as they can, as they have been doing. One last thing that I think it would be fair to call attention to, um, though it's extremely hard to discuss. Uh, there is, at IBM, a significant amount of secret contribution to the commons. The contributions themselves aren't necessarily secret, but the comments are rather deceptive. And so sometimes I find myself looking at the patch stream to a product, and I see uh, an IBM submission which says, mindless neatness, or just cleaning up here, or something like that. Uh, and uh, it isn't. Uh, it's tooth fairy behavior. Uh, and it's designed to invent around a patent. Uh, it's a comparatively open secret, I believe. I don't think that there's anybody in the industry who follows the game extremely closely who doesn't notice it being played. But it's a deniable activity. Um, that's not an activity in which I think there's any other party on Earth really well-crafted to engage. And it's unique. Um, my clients are often, I think, unaware of the extent to which they are benefited by that activity, which is precisely the intention of the actor. Um, that's not a part of what I'm here to talk about in any way. I neither recommend that conduct nor uh, want at every time where I mention it, and I very rarely do, to indicate that I'm ungrateful for it. I think it's enormously important, but I think it has almost nothing to do with what uh, the rest of the world, including you, might be about. Um, there is one more thing to say about this. Um, a comparison which I believe you may have intended and which I think is just. Uh, Microsoft has on several occasions attempted to make it appear uh, that IBM was in effect attempting to co-opt uh, for its own purposes the free world uh, and that it would leave the free world in the lurch the following morning and not respect us. Um, for a variety of reasons, of course, uh, that was not a bad campaign to try to run. Uh, like a number of Microsoft campaigns against the free world, it blew up on the launch pad more often than it safely gained any altitude. Uh, but there is and remains and always will remain a durable component of the free world that takes that possibility seriously. And when I am in Somers or in Ormonk, which I very frequently am, and when we talk about how to think long about the relationship between their world and my clients, which we often do, we sometimes talk about that. And that's the last distinction.
think that the point's an absolutely fair one. And I don't think that what I ought to suggest is an alternate form of contribution. <coughs> you and I both want to demand and work for is reduction of friction in the contribution processes of important and significant projects. It is, after all, the case that my work is the work of trying to make projects operate with less friction. If I see projects that we help to counsel and advise, making it hard for people to give code to them in ways that doesn't improve the legal defensibility of the product, our general response is to say, gee, why don't you let up a little bit on that and concentrate a little more on this over here, which might be a little more important to the acceptance of your project in the long run. Uh, in particular, one of the things which it seems to me is of the greatest possible value is to strengthen the best practices, understandings among projects out in the free world about how they ought to conduct their contribution lives. What they ought to do, given their policies about whether they do or don't take copyright assignments, how they judge patches from a legal point of view, and so on. But some portion of what you're referring to is not invented here-ness based on a kind of technical merit competition. Prove to me that your patch is really good and important, and I should accept something not invented here. And under circumstances where you meet that kind of resistance, I agree with you that you have no ecological responsibility to contribute back. Projects that don't make it easy to contribute back are making it hard to contribute back. And where it's hard, it's sometimes too hard. I would score that a fair call. But I would ask whether, if you consider the total possibilities across that interface, whether you really think that the sort of not invented here don't bring us your patches. We don't want to hear about it unless you're a saint. Um, whether you really think that that accounts for a numerically preponderant or significant portion of the decision about whether to recontribute. I would be entirely satisfied with a policy that says we try to contribute back unless there is a compelling re business reason to hold on to the modifications. And if the project is pissy with us, we just score them down as hard people to work with and we let it go with that. That seems to me entirely socially fair. Nobody would suggest that you ought to bear a heavier burden of get your, getting your patches in than any other hacker. And nobody would suggest, at least I don't think it would be fair to suggest, that you ought to give up any sooner than anybody else either. We want projects to work well. If you can help me persuade projects to work well, uh, you know, AMAC and I have spent some time making sure the GCC patches get into GCC. Um, and that's a client of mine, which I have some significant understanding of and influence over. And still, it takes a little bit of time to get patches into GCC, and particularly at the beginning of the relationship. I hope we've straightened that out now, and that things are smoother. I think that, in general, you ought to expect of the free world that it does what it can to reduce your friction. And therefore, I think what you're really saying, and what I really hear, is remember, it's going to be a two-way street. And I say, hallelujah. Yes? So the fiction of source uh, of member Siegel and Library Star is really helpful and it's great rhetoric, but it's also really extreme. I mean, honestly, do you think it's the best approach in 2007? And because it doesn't really endear you to diplomatic no, no, I thought, you were, uh, I, I thought you were hearing the irony in the way I described it. I, I, I would say that the fiction of light against dark is too colorful to be true, and I would say that the fiction of don't do evil is too colorful to be true, too. Um, what, what, we ought to do is, what we ought to do is recognize we all live in the real world, and nobody's fairy tales are the lights we actually drive by out there. But fairy tales are important, and they have function, and you have yours, and the free world has its, and Microsoft has theirs. And when I refer to them, you can sort of hear the scare quotes. Yes? My client's take on the Google Summer of Code program. Um, I, I don't think that I hear a sort of overall opinion of one kind or another. I think what I hear is the difference of opinions among people who went to summer camp and those who didn't, and those who loved it, and those who thought the counselors were mean. You know, I, that, that's, that, that's, that's sort of, that, 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 that's sort of that, that's sort of news and notes for me, rather than a sign of any long-term anything. 
to the question of whether the program itself is meaningfully and valuable to the free world, I have the slightest doubt. The ability to take advantage of hack attacks in order to make fixed and serious progress on stuff we all need is an enormous asset to the community. We all know that software is not produced in a neat, homogeneous flow, so many lines per hour, so many days a week, so many weeks a year. That's part of what made the proprietary software industry very bad at producing software. The ability to take advantage of people's seasonal desire to get a heap of work done all at once and go away again is a very powerful activity. I know that because I was like that once myself. When I worked as a developer of APL interpreters at IBM as a kid in college and in law school, uh, my tendency was to go on vacation from whatever work I was doing academically at the time, go to the Santa Teresa lab at the bottom of our now uh, endless valley, uh, and spend two or three weeks hacking on the VSAPL interpreter or APL2. And, you know, I could get a heap of work done in three weeks. It's, it would have been much harder to get that work done in six or ten or twelve weeks than it was to do it in three. I think the Google Summer of Code is, in that sense, an extraordinarily shrewd and community valuable way of taking advantage of how code is really made. I think it's a monument of excellence in how we can turn the market relations and the free world relations to common reinforcement. And what the opinion is of the particular will code for pizza worker at any given moment seems to me the least of the story. Yes? Yes, we signal to one another across an increasingly wide gulf, I have to say. Uh, um, my question has to do with a, a thread that's been went through your talk to some degree, but I don't know really it came out in an explicit way, which is the degree to which the perceived threat of Google, the Google, the trust of Google, is not necessarily related to whether they back to the open source community has to do with larger issues of trust, of big versus small, of data, privacy, just scariness, the ability to communicate, etc. Um, but this is a general problem, of course, one that could affect any user of Google. But the open source community has a particular amount of leverage should they decide that Google was Google for any of these other things. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, how we might approach that problem. On invitation, of course, I'm delighted to talk about it. The question then becomes, are you not really also calling attention to the problem of the long-term ecological consequences of general suspicion? And how does that ecological growth of general suspicion affect your remarks about the relations between Google and the free world? And I'm grateful to you for asking the question because, of course, it gives me permission to talk about the elephant in the parlor in a slightly more uh, candid way than I might if not invited. Um, one of the things which we knew even before New York profile writers started to get to it, is that the state has fundamentally lost its advantage in the collection and dissemination of intelligence. Uh, as writers have begun to call attention to the ways in which state organs of intelligence gathering have come to depend increasingly on open source intelligence, and as they have called increasing attention to the ways in which younger, more technically adaptive people within the intelligence community have recognized the low level of technological sophistication in government intelligence services, it has become passively clear to people. That is to say, I mean that there is an unarticulated articulate understanding that in the next generation, in the 21st century, the most powerful organs of intelligence collection and dissemination in the world are not going to be governments. And moreover, that government intelligence collection and dissemination is going to concentrate on the few traditional areas in which government intelligence gathering from satellites and by electronic interceptions is effective. That is, against military targets, against strategic assets and resources mostly having to do with the deployment of violence. When it comes to other aspects of traditional intelligence gathering, assessment of economic activity and potency, assessment of trends in society and political ideas, 
the primary palm in the collection and gathering and dissemination of intelligence is going to be held by private parties. And for this purpose, private parties means you. This is an intrinsic and unquestionable element in your relation to the outside world. You risk identification with the CIA of imagination. And what is done to reflect that problem outward in a revised and harmonized and humanized form is an important part of your relations to the public at large. It is a crucial aspect of the situation. But what I would say about it is that it risks the creation of a supersaturated solution of distrust in which seed crystals of particular kinds may cause a sudden phase transition in parts of the solution which are nearest to your intake filters. And because I have pointed to the free software flow critical to your day-to-day -day economic and long-term strategic welfare, that is a particular place in which a sudden phase transition from a solution of miasma of uncertainty or not clarity of trust might suddenly give way to a desire to do something that will stop the train. And it is particularly among hackers that a decision to do something individual to stop the train might arise. It is precisely the hackers who might first think to themselves, I can hack the intelligence collection system of the world on behalf of good. To bring it down to the real bottom of this story, I had a client once upon a time who was deeply concerned with government surveillance of private life and with the relation between that and government war making. And he decided to do something about it. He was called Phil Zimmerman and he decided to hack the system. You do not want a Zimmerman deciding to hack your system out of general distrust of the relationship between civil open source intelligence gathering and the fate of power in the 21st century. Thank you very much.